Hello and welcome to the Love History Podcast, where we explore what happens when an LGBTQ plus historian and a mudlark chat to their friends about their shared love of history. I'm a Marie Louise Plum, known on socials as Old Father Thames. And I'm Mock O'Keefe, and you can find me on all the socials, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube as Gay Aristo. And in this podcast, we talk to fellow history lovers, people working in history, and people who, through their lives, are making history. So sit back, relax, make your beverage of choice, and welcome to the Love History Podcast. Now, do remember to subscribe and follow so you can hear all the episodes in Series 1. So, Mock, what have you been up to, historically speaking, recently? So I have been uh, very interested recently in the World Monuments Fund. So the World Monuments Fund, I did a video with them on YouTube last year, and they work all over the world protecting heritage sites. And they are currently working on their watch list for 2024. These are historical sites that they are think are in danger, whether they're falling apart, whether they need repair, whether they're in war zones. So I've been chatting to them and working with them and talking about doing some more videos with them and looking at some of the heritage buildings around the world that are at risk. So that's what I've been doing, but maybe more to come on that in the future. And how about you, historically speaking, what have you been up to? I've been doing a lot of writing, actually. So I am writing something um, called The Tide Traveller's Guide. Now, I am a mudlark, but I'm the tide travelling mudlark. So I'm travelling through time on the tides of the River Thames and learning and researching about history through the finds uh, that turn up on the Thames, the artefacts I find. Now, whether that is personal histories or a period of time uh that is what i'm doing and you know it's just lots and lots of bag a mixed bag of stories just like the river thames out of context throws up one day it might be a roman find another day it might be a georgian find so i'm sort of hopping around all over the place writing these stories about tide traveling so yeah that's me Oh my God, wow, that sounds fascinating. I can't wait to see or to read whatever it is that you write. Now, before we get on to our interview today, which is absolutely fascinating with Elowen, and you'll introduce her in a moment, we've had a question sent in for you. Uh, and if anyone else would like to send us a question, please do. You can email us on lovehistorypodcast at gmail.com. So are you ready for your question? I am very ready. Okay, so it is a very Thames water-based question, and it's from Glenn, and he wants to know, what is the oldest ferry crossing on the Thames? Aha, very interesting question, Glenn. Thank you. Well, whew, I think the medi there are two that I know of um, that are written about. Obviously, you know, Roman London, I, there were crossings, um, whether they were ferries or, you know, what... The ones that I have read about are in the medieval period, around 1100, there was a horse ferry crossing. So, you know, horse ferry road, that a horse ferry. So how do you get your horses and carts from one side to the other? You have a horse ferry, which is a special kind of ferry to accommodate horses and carts with, a, I think it has a dip in the front, something like that. Um, so the horses can be on the ferry, get across the river. That's around 1100. Um, and then there's also another really interesting story, but it's more of a legendary um, story. Again, around 1100, I think 1106 maybe. And that is about a ferry run by, allegedly, <laughs> the father of St. Mary Overy. Um, this is all to do with Southwark Cathedral and his, uh, and, and what was there before it was Southwark Cathedral, before it was the, I think it was a prior or a monastery. So um, John Overs was the ferryman and he was this really miserly ferryman. Um, and there's some really fantastic stories about him. So do have a little search online for John Overs or o Overies or Overy and um, his daughter, St. Mary Overy. And you will be in for a surprise. But yeah, so to answer, around 1100 are the ones I know of. Lovely. But enough about us. We have a very exciting show for you today. We sat down with Elowin Stevenson, also known as Elowin the Warrior. 
Now, Elowin, yeah, she does a lot of really interesting stuff. Her background is in archaeology. She does a lot of uh, historical teaching, practical teaching. She leads tours on the River Thames as part of Thames Explorer. But the thing that I'm most interested in, interested in is her adventures hitchhiking across Europe and South America. So let's have a listen to our interview and then we'll come back and chat about what we've learned. Fabulous. So let's go over to meet the warrior herself. Elowin, welcome to the Love History Podcast. It's lovely to have you here. So nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honoured. So I've got to say, you've just got back from Morocco, right? So you've been travelling. You literally yep. landed whenever, last night, I think. And you were... Actually, it was a very reasonable flight. It left from the middle of the Atlas Mountains at 11 a.m. And it was an on-time Ryanair flight. Bang on 1.30 back at Stansted. So big ups to Ryanair. Basically <laughs> empty flight. Everyone had their own aisle to sleep. Other airlines are available. <laughs> But yeah, okay, so you got back, and then immediately you were on the River Thames foreshore leading a guided tour. Was it for Thames Explorer? Is that what? It was you... for Thames Explorer Trust this morning with a lovely, lovely family. Yep. Your background is in archaeology, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I studied archaeology at university, realized from the training digs that archaeology was a badly paid, very cold outdoor profession, and decided after I graduated that I'd rather go into a badly paid indoor profession working in museums and heritage sites. Um, and from that, I've gotten lots of fun jobs uh, working in the very hobbies that I enjoy. So I'm really, really grateful for the opportunities. But also, I have worked really hard to get where I am, and I'm very proud of uh, what I've achieved. I now have eight different jobs um, that I do all zero hours, all freelance, wow. which gives me the time to travel. So obviously, when I travel, I'm not getting any paid time off, but I've wrangled it pretty well, I think, and that I can save up and I do travel very, very cheaply. So you work the jobs to travel, which is your so the main thing I want to talk to you about, because it is so fascinating to follow you on Instagram, which is at um, elowin.the.warrior. Yeah, that's correct. Hello in the warrior and you so you travel around and you do these kind of daily video um and image uh, like blogs or vlogs about where you're going the historic sites you're visiting how you get there and it's the how you get there that is so interesting will you tell us a bit about your adventures in hitchhiking across um eastern europe was it and south america just tell us a bit about that yeah usually um so I wasn't brave enough to hitchhike much in South America. I did hitchhike a little in Brazil in the countryside because generally speaking, wherever you go in the world, in the countryside is where people tend to not have cars or um, they'll be more reliant on people that are driving pickup trucks and they can just flag, it, flag down a ride and jump in. Um, which I think as well is the case around the UK. I think in the countryside, especially out in the West Country, down in Cornwall, I think there are still the last bastions of hitchhiking available in the UK. Wow. A slight disclaimer, we're not advising you go hitchhiking, dear listener. We're just saying this is what no. Ellen's doing. <laughs> no, um, definitely. Don't try this at home. Um it is a it is a, a more risky way of traveling, certainly. And every lonely planet will say we do not advise hitchhiking. And um I got into it because I I, I trust that people are good and that um it's a great way to get to know people and you get dropped in places you would never visit on the bus. You get dropped in these tiny little villages in very, very rural Lithuania on the road where you wish that they hadn't left you because then you're walking for two hours because it's a public holiday and all the cars are full of families and have no space or there's no traffic. Um, but then you think, when else am I going to get dropped in rural Lithuania on a beautiful August day with all these butterflies and absolutely no traffic? And you just walk for a couple hours and trust that if you need to fill your water bottle, you could stop in a farmhouse and ask them and they might even fill your water bottle and then say, oh, my cousin's popping by in half an hour and they're driving in that direction. So this is the things that happen all the time when you when you take take the risks and you put your faith in the goodness of people. And um, I don't know if you guys watched the was it the was it race across the world on BBC where they where they hitchhike and they get across. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that 
Okay. And and they they really do prove that people are good. And you know, even if you're taking local buses, people will try to put you on the right bus or look out for you. And yeah, I think it's it's quite cool. And that's why that's why getting off the beaten track is so rewarding as well. You get to meet. I mean, really, it's, it play it ties into that historical um, sense of uh, okay. The the main thing I can think of is pilgrimage, and when or or seeking arms. Say you're going on a long journey, and you're like, hello, but poor traveler seeking arms. <laughs> it's very true. And so it really ties in, doesn't it, with that? Because I remember, I think it might have been when you were traveling in the Balkans, and I may be wrong, so correct me, and you were sharing all the meals you were having, and you were like breaking bread with people, and like they were inviting you into their home. All and, the time. And did you have, so it's two, the question is twofold. Did you know really where any of those people were before you turned up or and the second question is you visited lots of historic sites and gave so much information about those sites did you already have that info or did you learn it when you were there and you were sharing as it was happening uh great question thank you for uh, appreciating my historical facts which may or may not be true because i just write what people tell me um so the people I never know beforehand, I, uh, with the exception of a few people, like I just went in Morocco and stayed with my good friend who I met while I was hitchhiking, but he was in a hostel. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, I just, you meet people when you travel alone because people are interested in you. If you travel with someone else or if you travel with a group, people aren't going to get involved because they think, oh, I don't want to bother them. Uh, mm -hmm. People are respectful and people are also very curious though. So they really, really want to talk to you. But if you're yeah. with in a couple or with your friend, they're like, oh no, let's, let's just leave them be. But if you're on your own, suddenly you're just like, oh my gosh, where are you from? What are you doing here? Why are you traveling alone? Why aren't you married? Yeah. That's a big one. <laughs> now I'm old. Um, why aren't you married? Where are your children? I'm like, <laughs> lol. Um, I'm just a I'm just a massive loser in most of the world, um, is what I found out as I as I get older. <laughs> but the the people that you meet are they might be uh the best the best question that you get asked when hitchhiking is, are you in a hurry? Always say no. Because they will then proceed to take you back to their house in Herzegovina of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they will show you their working water mill and their bees, and they will feed you honey from the hives and explain how the water mill is uh, actually bashing all those big Eastern European blankets to clean them before wow. the winter yeah. sets in and dry them out in the hot sun of September. And yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't get to do that if you had said, oh, actually, I really need to get to my hostel by this and this time because yeah. it doesn't really matter when you get there. Um, and someone will always make sure you get there. And it's like you're having snapshots of their daily life. You're getting a view into life as it's happening and completely the traditions, the kind of what what at different times of the year, different times of the month. Yeah. The seasonality that we have missed a lot of in Western culture is still very much alive in these places and the traditions and things that go with it. Um and then, you know, often because people will feel like, oh, I'm making them late, they will then take you exactly where you need to be. When I was in New Zealand, um, that was the first place I hitchhiked, actually. I was right. in this big pickup truck with this guy, and the pickup truck broke down on a Sunday in the Nelson Lakes National Park in South Island, which is one of the most beautiful places you could ever possibly hope to get stuck with a broken down <laughs> car. But because it was a Sunday, we had a long wait to, for, the, for the repairs to come out. And so we just hiked up the mountain and just watched the world go by and wow. chatted and just enjoyed it it was such a nice place to be stuck and then when the when it was repaired and everything he felt so bad i don't know why but he drove me right to my hostel and you know he didn't have to he went well out of his way so yeah pe people are good and i think you know the the other thing is like what what did people get back from a hitchhiker and it's just he would have had to do the ride on his own and been stuck on his own and he would have rather had some company and someone to share that view with and um that's at least how he said. And he was really respectful when he dropped me off at the hostel. He was like, at, at the time I had a, a partner and he said, look, I know you have a boyfriend, so um, I'm going to respect that. But if you had been single, I would have asked if you wanted to come back and stay at mine because we had such a nice day together. And I was like, that's really sweet. Thank you. That's, that's really kind sweet. of you. Yeah. <laughs> so I would have made, I would have made a move, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am a gentleman. God bless him. Do you learn the history of certain places in advance or is it 
you mentioned word of mouth. Um, when you get to these places, are you researching when you're there in situ or how do you do it? This is so embarrassing. I am so <laughs> unlearned about the world and, you know, major conflicts will pass me by and I will go to that country and I'll be like, no way, I had no idea about the Balkans all hating each other. What? <laughs> um, and honestly, I think sometimes it's better that you know less before you go or you just wouldn't go because you'd say, oh no, that's a war zone until about five minutes ago. When I was in Myanmar, I was actually, um, that was another place I hitchhiked. I actually ended up in jail for hitchhiking there because I went down a big road where you're not supposed to hitchhike. Um, <gasps> It, wow. it, it wasn't also that it was also because I um, the truck drivers ended up letting me stay in their house because there was no place to stay. Um, it was stupid. I was I was being silly. Um, I just really didn't want to take the bus all the way back to Mandalay to go all the way down to Inlay Lake, which is a whole other bus ride. These so, everyday um, issues, these everyday problems, these everyday issues. Well, I got off the I got off the train, hitched along the road, ended up at this Nepali truck stop, sang some Bollywood songs with the Nepali owners who were lovely. They fed me and watered me and flagged down a corn truck that I lay in the back of. It was getting dark. It was slash and burn season, so the burning was happening, and you could see nothing but blackness and fire and stars oh. it was so trippy oh i was lying in the back goodness. of this corn truck thinking i don't know where i'm gonna end up tonight but it was the most peace i'd ever felt and i think that's the thing about hitchhiking that i love is that you have zero control over what's going to happen so you really can't worry about it yeah i'm such a worry wart i'm such a annoying type a that i, I, I really that. enjoy taking myself out of that and forcing i would the, never have guessed chaos. that i would never <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I hide it so well. Yeah, but um, but but in in Myanmar, for example, you know, you you are seeing a very much a curated element of what the government wants you to see. And when I didn't, when, when I I wasn't expecting what happened. I just wanted to go down that road, and I heard tell of a monastery that you could, as a tourist, stay in on that road. And I was trying to head for the monastery, and I had plenty of time. And the truck drivers were headed in that direction. And it was only 10 kilometers. I could have walked it. It was a straight road. But they insisted that I stay in their house. And their wives cooked me dinner. And we sat on the floor and watched Korean soap operas. And um, I went out to the well to brush my teeth. And when I came back in, their faces had changed. And I was like, yeah, I knew this would happen because it's so illegal to have any tourists stay in your house. You have to be registered in a, in a, in a proper government well, official guest I house. mean, I can imagine that. I can imagine that, yeah. But yeah, and so, and I felt awful. They took me to the police station. The police put me on a wooden bench and questioned me. And thank God for David Beckham, because when I said I was English, they were like, oh, David Beckham, because they love football and they love men in sarongs. So <laughs> David Beckham saved my life. Um, Mark, do you have no. a question? <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I just, was just picturing David Beckham in a sarong for a moment there. So <laughs> do carry on. I'll, I'll, With his cornrows. In that moment. <laughs> okay so mm, delicious you really have run run the gamut yes what, what, just just yeah. quickly just quickly with that one i felt really bad because i thought i'd got the family in trouble but apparently and i ended up getting that the police could not have been nicer once they realized that i was just being a massive idiot just another dumb white tourist um they let me stay overnight in the police cell, like in, in the office, not the cell. They let me sit in the cell for a picture because they thought it would be funny. And then they showed me how the door locked from the inside because I was obviously in a police station full of men. Um, they let me sleep on the, the chief's sun lounger and try on his hat. And um, all night long, I was just, I didn't sleep. I was so worried about that family. I thought they'd get in trouble. And yeah, I was so worried for them and, you know, they might lose their truck license or whatever. And they put me on a bus in the morning, a local bus. And the locals were like, just, I kept hearing the word of where I'd come from. Because obviously they're like, where, who is that? What is she doing in this bus? Where is she going? Kind of thing. So I arrived at Inlay Lake. I checked into my hostel. And luckily there was um, a Danish man staying there who had lived in Myanmar for many years and worked with the, he was like an ambassador for Denmark. And he knew a lot about the ins and outs of um uh, Burmese Mer Myanmar culture and he said the police are always on the side of the people it's the military you have to watch out for so okay. the people, they won't get in trouble so, that, so you left it all fine their trucks weren't taken away and yeah living well, I felt really stupid and that's another reason why I would never really advocate for hitchhiking because yeah I got lucky that one time but it's not only you you have to think about the impact you have on other people as well yeah and so as a result since then I've really just stuck to Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, 
countries where you sort of know the lay of the land a little bit better. Yeah. Um, Because the the last thing you would want was someone's good deed to get them in trouble for any reason. Yeah, precisely. Well, that's very mindful and respectful of you. That's very good. Um, Why King George III? (laughs) Why Liv left King George III? Yeah. Okay. Um, So... After I graduated uni, I was unemployed for many months, and I was just volunteering in five different places. Like, archaeology graduates, raise your hands, we've all been there. Um, Mm. But I ended up getting a job at Kew Palace in Kew Gardens, which is one of Historic Royal Palace's properties. It was, I was playing the long game, I always wanted to work at the Tower of London, hashtag Tower of Funden. Um, I do now, which is great, I love it so much, it's probably my favourite place on earth. But... um, to get it, I got into Kew Palace, and Kew Palace was the summer residence of King George III, and he was just such a nice guy. Like, he loved his family, he <laughs> he had all these mad hobbies, I think that's why I liked him so much, like designing military uniform and growing plants, and he encouraged them to bring sheep over to the Antipodes, and that's why there's so many sheep over there with merino wool, and he has all these, like, really long reaching impacts and yes he lost the colonies and american tourists were always like why do you like king george so much it's like he was just cool um i just i just appreciate an eccentric person who really didn't wish badly of uh the world in general he was you know he was very sheltered there's a lot of a lot of scandals with lord north etc in his early years and obviously he did have um, mental health issues and i yeah. think that's um, in later years, there's been a big, a big 180 where they've said, hang on, let's learn more about this character and, yeah, and the sort of person that he was. And I know that Q Palace a couple of years ago, they did a big, um, well, it's not a big palace. So they couldn't do a big exhibition, but they did a small exhibition about his mental health. And there is something there to Q Palace when you go up to the top floor where it's unfinished and you sort of, if you just stay there for a while, you can feel the... You can feel it. old houses and old buildings, Mock, as you know, have a certain something about them, and they do really have uh, an energy. And I think um, he was where he, where he spent the last years of his life, and he finally ended up in Windsor, and they put straw down to cover the funeral carriage of his beloved wife, Queen Charlotte, so that he wouldn't be distressed, because he didn't know, he didn't understand that she'd passed away. And his favorite daughter, Amelia, who was born on my birthday, um, 7th of August gang, rise up. <laughs> Amelia, he, he believed in his later years that his favorite daughter had not died really young at 27, that she was living a, a happy life and that she was off in Germany and she would come back any moment. Oh. Yeah. An interesting character, well, for yeah, sure. Yeah, so I knew there'd be a lot, of, a, a lot to that, to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> So you're so you're so you're now working at the Tower of London. How is that? What are you doing there? Like, what's what's the vibe? Oh, uh, the Tower of London. Yeah. Um. So every time someone asks me that, I say very little, but that's just a joke because actually we do loads of stuff. But if you were to see us in a gallery, we are mostly there in our very smart uniforms, telling people not to take photos of the crown jewels. And um, in the White Tower, we talk a bit about like what a garderobe is. It's a toilet, and um, directing people to the actual toilet, the modern toilet. Um. You know, on on the late night events, drunk people do mistake the garderobes for normal toilets, oh no. which is never fun. Oh no. um, but I am what's called a warden there. I'm just a casual, but um, I've met the best friends of my life from the Tower of Funden, and and the people there. It's really like a big family. And what's cool is like we have these week these monthly socials in the club, which is the Keys, which is the pub in the Tower. In the Tower, as well as, yeah. yeah, as well as very cheap beer and like very there's always like a disco and um a raffle and uh fluff who organizes it really does so well it's so much fun there it's just great it's everyone gets to know each other and of course you get to know all the yeoman warders and their families and their pets and it is just lovely i love the way we work together it's so i nice. love that about about this country particularly in london and you have these strange little worlds within worlds for example exactly in the city is a strange the city of london is a Operates in a very strange way, and I'm not, I don't mean the businesses so much, but more like the um, guilds and the different worshipful companies. And it's just very, very antiquated. And and again, the Tower of London. Mock took me to Windsor um, because he's a fellow. Um, Whoa. 
and and they you know we 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 were let into areas that people don't normally go into and they're sort of you know people living in their own lodgings there and amazing so, I think that's what people forget these historic buildings whether it's a palace whether it you know was a, a prison um and a palace there are communities still living in them now so yeah i'm a fellow at windsor castle and what i love is when i get to stay overnight and the doors close um and then you're there in this sort of bizarre village where you have people coming out onto their from these little kind of <clears throat> houses coming out and having barbecues you've got people jogging around the white tower you've got people sort of you know yeah. putting, out, putting out in the summer putting out kind of deck chairs outside saint george's chapel and having a glass of wine Incredible. and and that that's the same sort of thing you know but i love the fact that it's still being used and enjoyed by contemporary people it's not just a relic it's actually still being experienced whether during the day it's experienced as a piece of history but at night or in the evening and at weekends when it's closed it's being experienced as as it was as a bustling community just as william the conqueror would have wanted <laughs> <laughs> and it must be the same with the old tower the tower of fundant have yeah. you ever stayed over i haven't stayed over no but it's uh you know it's always a possibility. There's always the, the flats for various people to stay in. I've never got drunk enough that I've needed to stay over. Um, and also, I'm only like a 40-minute cycle home, so f 35 minutes when I've been drinking. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it is it is very, very doable. Plan for the future. We do not advise drinking and cycling. No, nor hitchhiking. No, we do not advise hitchhiking. But we do advise King George III. <laughs> no. Okay, so Eloin, finally, tell me a little bit about the Foreshore tours you are running um, with, and it's part of Thames Explorer, isn't it? What, what yeah, exactly that's are you right. doing? Um, so Thames Explorer Trust is a really great organization that takes um, adults, children, community groups, private tours down to the foreshore. We don't just run history walks looking at archaeology. We also take kids on boat trips, a lot of whom have never been on a boat before. And it's really exciting for me to take them on a boat. And they're like, what? Herons roosting trees? Miss, that's mad. And that kind of thing. Um, and we also do ecology walks where we find things like flounder and elvers and all sorts of things living in the water. So to show how much it's changed since the biological death of the river in the 1970s. Um, but the mudlarking tours are really special because mudlarking is such a difficult thing to do, obviously without the permits being issued at the moment. Um, and also during lockdown, people got more and more interested in mudlarking. Yeah. So many great books have been published and so many great YouTube channels. And of <laughs> course, you. our friend Instagram has really made it applicable to the masses. Um, but the Thames Explorer Trust is licensed to take people down. And when I've got my bright high-vis yellow vest on, I'm licensed to take people down so um we find the most basic things you could imagine pottery pipe stems pipe bowls um someone not us but someone else in the foresher once found a homemade explosive that was yeah. uh, that was interesting um luckily it wasn't my group and they disposed of it well so luckily i didn't have to do anything with that um you know just random things you can find luckily no human remains as of yet yeah but it is it's a really great way to responsibly engage with the river and we throw all our fines back at the end. I like to offer them back to the goddess of the river and say thank you for the fines so that not only can people find them in the future, but also it just reminds people that we are responsible for our river. And if you take everything home, then there's not going to be anything to find it. As you know, we've, we've noticed yeah. as mudlarks that the fines have decreased substantially yeah, yeah. in the last 10 years since it's got popular. You know, they have definitely, but I think also because there's so many more people on the foreshore, there's, um, you know, there are still fines there, but perhaps so many people that more people are finding more things. So yeah, it's, it's interesting that you said the river goddess, because I had this conversation the other day about the Monica Oldfather Thames and the spirit, the personification of the river. I was talking to my friend Charles and he said, oh, well, I call rubbish on that. You know, he's, that's just a male patriarchal thing. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be old father Thames. If anything, the river is like Mami Wata, like a female body, you know, a female spirit. Um, I yeah. Correct so, me if I'm wrong, but I think Mami Wata and the Condomble goddesses have a lot in common as well with the West African river goddesses. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he was yeah he's big into. But me. I mean, 
I don't know that much about Roman history, but I just love the name Sulis Minerva from Bath, you know, that goddess. So I kind of think, well, it's all the water's connected at some end, but I quite like the idea of it being a river goddess. She gives and she takes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like the seven. The seven has a river mm. goddess as well. There I you think. Go. Um, and the boar. Yeah. So there we go. Elowin, we could chat for hours. Thank you so much for coming on and um, sharing with us. And so your Instagram is at elowin.the.warrior. Yep, that's me. Warrior, not warrior. Although yeah. sometimes it definitely feels like the other one. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I can't wait to hear the rest of the people's podcast and to be among such interesting other interviewees. It's been really nice. Thank you oh, so much. Fantastic. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Oh, well, that was fascinating. She's absolutely brilliant, isn't she? Yeah, she is really great. Just so many adventures and so much to learn. So, yeah. So, talking of learning, what did you learn from Warrior today? I really loved about what Elowin was saying is her, how she engages with people and communities when she travels. Now, for me, someone who does a lot of research about artifacts and sort of the past with my marking, mm -hmm. it's really good having secondary resources, you know, books, programs, uh, podcasts. For example. For example. But it's in addition to that, that primary resource of talking to people, engaging with what they're doing, um, whether it's listening to their histories, listening to their everyday life, and, you know, getting involved. I like how she gets involved. Um, so, yeah, that's what I took away. And what about you? What did you learn from Elowin? I mean, I could learn so much, and I'm certainly going to go to the Tower of Fundon. I think it's brilliant as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a control freak as you know um like Elowin, i like to know where i'm sleeping tonight and i plan my diary you know weeks in advance but when she talked about being on that truck and not knowing where she was going to sleep and just kind of surrendering to what was happening being very present i thought i could probably get some life skills learnings from that so i was thinking how can i perhaps be a little bit more present as opposed to kind of planning and being in control let myself perhaps lose control a little bit more and see where it takes me Gosh, two great takeaways there that we've had. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening today. If you have any comments or any questions, we would love to hear from you. Remember to email us on lovehistorypodcast at gmail.com. Subscribe and follow the podcast to make sure you don't miss our fabulous episode, which is coming up next week. So take care. Enjoy the foreshore, Old Father Thames. This is Gay Aristo saying goodbye, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>